Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to another virology lecture. So today we're going to talk about one of the most highly anticipated topics this semester, and that is all about vaccines. So I hope you all are excited. And what we're going to do today is we're going to go through a bit of an introduction. So talking a little bit about history, we'll talk about herd immunity, we'll talk about some of the goals of vaccination, and then we'll get into how do we actually make vaccines? What are the different ways that that scientists do this and we'll talk about some relevant examples and then we'll end with an outlook on what are some of the things that are going on some of the research in terms of vaccination that is happening for our current SARS-CoV-2. So let's go ahead and let's first start with something that we've already seen. So when we started talking about antivirals, this was one of the first things that we said. We said that when it comes to viruses, we have two arms of defense. We have antivirals, which was in topic 18, and then now in topic 19, we're going to talk about that second arm of defense, and that is vaccination. So when it comes to vaccines, vaccines are actually our best defense when it comes to viruses. So that's something to keep in mind as we are continuing through this topic. So before we get into herd immunity and kind of thinking about what that is, we're first going to talk a little bit about the history of vaccinations. So hopefully you all recognize this gentleman here on the right. So let me know in the comments below if you recognize who this is. So this is Edward Jenner. And we actually talked a little bit about Edward Jenner at the beginning of the semester, so it was probably day two of classes that we talked about him. And not only is he known as the father of immunology, but he is also credited with the development of our first vaccination. And of course, the vaccine that he developed was against smallpox. So like any good scientist, he of course made observations and his observations included that if there were milkmaids milk maids that were working with cows, that they actually would contract cowpox. And if they had contracted cowpox and then were um, exposed to smallpox, they would actually be protected against smallpox. So that was his observation. So then using that observation, he went on to demonstrate that if we inoculated people with extracts from cowpox lesions, that this would induce mild symptoms of the disease, but it would protect against smallpox. And so, of course, cowpox and smallpox are very similar viruses. So you can say in a way that they're cousin viruses. They have different preferences in their hosts of course. So smallpox, the only host is humans, but for cowpox, that virus can infect humans, but it does cause a much milder form of disease. And so you can actually get um, immunity and protection against smallpox. And so, of course, even though he is credited with the first vaccination, and rightfully so, he was the first to demonstrate this with experimentation, in the 11th century, we still had a form of vaccination going on. And so you might recall from the beginning of the semester that we had mentioned this idea of variolation. And so, of course, variolation had to do with something very similar, but instead of inoculating patients with cowpox lesions, we would inoculate people with material from a smallpox pustule. And so what we would do is we would scratch part of the pustule from a person and then we would scratch it onto the arm or blow it into the nose. And unfortunately, unlike vaccinations nowadays, of course, this had a much higher percentage lethality. So it had about a 30% lethality. So 70% of the people who went through variolation were okay, but of course, 30% is much, much higher than we would like to see, obviously. And so for variolation, this was something done, that was done in China. Um, later on, Lady Montague also brought this practice into the Americas early um, during with the settlers. And so, of course, this is something that happened over years, but it was not until Edward Jenner that we had our first official vaccine. And then moving forward, 
1885, we had Pasteur, and Pasteur actually um, developed the rabies vaccine. And if you recall from the beginning of the semester, we talked about where the word vaccine comes from. So Pasteur is the person who actually introduced the term vaccine, and vacca, V-A-C-C-A, is actually Latin for cow, and he did this in honor of Jenner. And then in the 1930s was when vaccines for yellow fever and for flu came out. So we, of course, when we talk about vaccines, we will be talking about anti-vaxxers as well and some of the ideas that go on through society. Well, it turns out that anti-vaxxers have been a part of society even in the 1700s. And so in this image here, the this image was painted in the 1700s, and this was right around the time that Edward Jenner's vaccination came out, and I'm actually going to zoom in here a little bit so you can get a better look at it, but this is demonstrating some of the ideas that people thought at the time, and so people actually believed that if we were using a virus that infected cows to inoculate ourselves to protect ourselves against smallpox, then that would cause cow-like features to appear. So in this image, we can see some of these people beginning to have cow-like features um, throughout their body. So even in the 1700s, these were ideas that swept the population. So anti-vaxxers are definitely not a thing of just now, but they are a thing of the past as well. So of course, moving forward, we know that large-scale vaccinations can be very successful. And these are two examples, and we'll start on the left. So on the left here, we have polio virus. And you can see here we've got the first vaccine against polio, so the inactivated vaccine, and we see a huge drop in polio, and then we see a little bit of an increase, and then we see the introduction of a second vaccine, so we'll talk about the two types of vaccines against polio later on, probably not until day two, and we see another decrease. And of course, this has stayed pretty steady and pretty low. Um, and then on the bottom here, we have measles. So we can see the vaccine was introduced and we see overall a decrease. We see some increases and we'll talk about some of those fluctuations, but um, the measles vaccine saves millions of lives every single year. So if we take a look at the graph on the right, what we have on the x-axis here is time. On the y-axis, we have the estimated measles deaths in millions. And so what we have this purple line on the top here. This is the measles deaths if we had no vaccination, and this is with vaccination. And so these yellow bars here tell us the estimated deaths prevented by measles vaccination yearly. And as you can see, it is millions of lives that are saved every single year by vaccination. And so we have a lot of evidence that shows that these large-scale vaccinations can be very successful. But of course, that requires the participation of everyone. And so in the case of these large-scale vaccinations, of course, in some cases, eradication is possible. So in the case of smallpox, of course, smallpox has been eradicated. And something to keep in mind when we think about eradication is the idea that eradication is only possible if there's one host. And so the reason that smallpox eradication was possible is because humans are the only host of smallpox. A virus that has alternative host species cannot be eliminated by vaccinating a single host. So that's something to keep in mind. So of course, nowadays, vaccines are something that we do and they're a part of every single day lives, right? So we immunize a lot of people every single year. So we immunize kids of all ages. So infants as they get into their toddler years, into their teenage years, um, adults of all ages get immunized. Of course, this is something that we do for pets as well. 
And so we take our dog in every single year to get her shots up to date. And I know many of you have cats and dogs at home, and I know many of you do the same. And it turns out that we even immunize wild animals. And you might be wondering, how the heck do we immunize wild animals, right? You are probably picturing people running around with needles trying to, like, jump on wild animals and inoculate them. That's not quite what happens. That's kind of what goes through my mind, too. But it turns out that one of the ways that we immunize against wild animals is we drop bait or we drop this food that has rabies vaccine in it. So we can, we have rabies vaccines that are oral. And so what we will do is in areas where there's a lot of rabies that is present in the population of animals, we'll actually go in and drop this bait and, you know, lure the animal in with food. They'll go and bite the food and then they will get tasty snack, but they will also get vaccinated against rabies. And so it's pretty amazing. And, you know, the key with this idea of vaccination is that because of immunization, because of vaccines, many childhood diseases are rare nowadays. So now that we've kind of talked about the background and that introduction, let's talk a little bit about the goal of vaccination. So how do they work? Why do they, why do we do this? So for vaccines, vaccines are going to stimulate a protective immune response. And the key here is memory. And so essentially what they do is they teach our immune system to prevent viral infections. So how does that work? So what we're going to do is we're going to draw a couple of graphs here. So on the x-axis here, we're going to have time in days. And then on the y-axis, we'll have antibody prevalence. Let's put some days on here. 7, 14, 21. All right. So when you are first introduced to a new virus, your immune system's learning something new, whether it is through a vaccine or through catching a cold, one of the things that we see is that we get a curve that looks something like this. And so what this is, is this is our initial immune response. And typically for the first infection, about 17 to 14 days later, you have an adaptive response. So our immune system is made up of the innate immune system and the adaptive immune system. So of course, our innate immune system is what we're born with. It's kind of a general immune system, and that's going to include things like fever, inflammation, phagocytosis, in general, trying to get rid of whatever foreign body there is. And then the adaptive response is a learned response, and it is a specific response to the specific thing that is causing our immune system to turn on. So when you have an, a first infection or an initial infection, you of course have your innate immune system that turns on. That is going to present the foreign body to the adaptive immune system. And it takes seven to 14 days for the adaptive response to occur. Now, of course, after you clear the infection, so here we're showing the infection has been cleared, we have a decrease in those antibodies. But those antibodies are always available at a low level and maintain immunity. So let's say that years later, maybe four years down the line, you are unlucky enough to be exposed to the same pathogen, you will see a much larger and a much faster mount and stronger response to that same infection. And so when this happens, you will get mild or sometimes in some cases, you get an apparent inf reinfection. And again, the key here, as you can tell, is that this is not only a faster, but it's also a stronger response. 
And the reason that that works that way is because you have memory. You have those antibodies from the first time that you saw that pathogen and your body's like, all right, I know what this is. I'm ready to go. We can fight it off and let's go and get rid of this foreign body. And so the goal here with vaccines is to essentially create that on the left of hers without getting you very sick, but to go through the process of making those antibodies so that you have that low level always ready and waiting in case you get exposed to that pathogen. So we can't talk about how vaccines work without talking about herd immunity. Herd immunity is definitely a key concept of how vaccines work. And this is something on the news right now that we're seeing a lot of people throw around. Maybe not so much on the news, but definitely on social media. Um, I was scrolling through my Twitter the other day and I saw someone who commented on, you know, this is stupid. We should just open the country and we should all just do whatever we want and just let her and let herd immunity take over because herd immunity will save us. And I'm fairly confident that the individual that tweeted that did not really have a good understanding of of how herd immunity works. But that is all right because that will not be the case for all of you. So let's talk a little bit about what is herd immunity and what the heck is this concept. So let's first start by defining it and then we'll draw a couple of pictures to illustrate how this works. So herd immunity really deals with population scale immunity. So on the previous page, we really focused on an individual's immune system. So an individual learning a pathogen and learning that memory and learning how to get rid of that. When we talk about herd immunity, we are talking about the entire population. And when it comes to herd immunity, we need a critical level. And we will talk about what it means to need a critical level here, and we'll actually use the coronavirus as an example. And another way that we can think about herd immunity is this idea of indirect protection from infectious diseases. But the key here is that to have this indirect protection from these diseases, this is only if the critical level is met or exceeded. So that is definitely a key of herd immunity is you cannot just say, oh, I'm just not going to get vaccinated. I'll just rely on herd immunity because we must meet that critical level for this to work. So we're going to draw a couple of pictures here. And what we're going to do is we're going to just draw dots and those are going to represent the population and we'll do black will be immune we'll do a purple circle to represent infected individuals and then we'll do pink to represent susceptible individuals and we'll do three scenario. So we'll do, what does it look like if 10% of the population is immune, if 50% is immune, and what does it look like if 90% is immune? So let's start with 10% first. So let's go ahead and draw one individual that is immune, and we'll draw eight individuals that are susceptible. And let's throw one infected individual in here. So when we have this one infected individual, if we take a look at our population, the majority of our population is susceptible. So this individual can get a lot of people sick. And the reason for that is because we have many susceptible hosts, and so disease will spread pretty quickly. And of course, there are different mechanisms by how diseases can spread and how quickly it would spread would depend on the disease, but in general, at a 10% immune level of a population, there's a lot of susceptible hosts. Disease will spread pretty quickly. So as we're seeing right now in our current pandemic, um, 
no one had immunity against this, at least that we know of, right? There's always people who have natural immunity, but most of the hosts are of her susceptible, and so we see very quick spreading. So what about when we have 50% immunity? So let's now draw five of our 10 people here as immune, and then we'll include one infected individual, and then we'll include our susceptible people. So now we will still get spreading of the disease, but we have a decrease in disease spread. And the reason for that is we have a decrease in susceptible hosts. And so what we'll see is that less of the population will be sick. So we will get some indirect protection from these individuals. Now, 50% is not enough for herd immunity to work. Um, it's usually upwards of 70%, but we'll calculate that here in a second, and we'll talk about why some viruses are more and why, are, and why some are less. So what if we have a population where 90% of individuals are immune? So we've got nine circles here representing our immune, and then maybe we have one person who is susceptible. This one person who is susceptible is indirectly protected by the herd. And so when we reach levels of 90% immunity, we definitely see more protection from these infectious diseases. So there are a couple of key points here when it comes to herd immunity. So let's go ahead and start with a blank page. So a few key points here about herd immunity. So when it comes to herd immunity, something to keep in mind is that we don't have to immunize 100% of the population to stop viral spread, right? But of course, the number of, individu of individuals that are immunized must be high enough to impede viral transmission. And so the question of Hearst then becomes, well, when does viral spread stop? And we say that the viral spread is going to stop when the probability of infection drops below a critical threshold. So when we think about the critical threshold, it's going to be based on two things of Hearst. It's going to be based on the virus, and it's going to be based on the population. So the critical threshold is virus and population specific. So for population, this is going to include things like density and mobility, things of that nature. Whereas for the virus, a really great example for how we look at this is going to be R naught. So this R sub zero is pronounced R naught. And we've mentioned this before in class, and you've probably heard a lot about this on the news. And we'll talk more about it here in a couple of pages. So we will come back to this idea. But in terms of a critical threshold and what's the rough estimate of how much of the population must be immune, it's usually, again, it's virus specific, but it's usually 80 to 95% of the population. So again, this 80 to 95% is just usually where most viruses fall. And again, this critical threshold is not only based on the virus, but it's also population specific. So let's go ahead and give you a couple of examples here. So I'm gonna give you, before we handle this question of what is R naught and what does it have to do with herd immunity, I'm actually gonna give you examples of some critical thresholds and then we'll get back to this question. So for smallpox, our critical threshold is about 80 to 85%. 
For measles, it's much higher. So it's between 93 and 95 percent. So there are a couple of key points here. And, you know, oftentimes people take these critical thresholds as, oh, well, if measles is 93 to 95 percent, well, we only have to vaccinate 95 percent of the population and then that's good enough. That other 5 percent we don't have to worry about. But as you can imagine, no vaccine is 100 percent effective. So what that means is that not everyone will elicit a good immune response. And so as an example of that, when we have 80% of the population that is vaccinated against measles, we actually see that only about 76% is immune. And for whatever reason, about 4% of the population does not respond to the vaccine. And so we can actually do these studies. So scientists do this all the time to figure out what's this critical threshold, you know, what popu what percentage of the population won't respond so that we get an estimate of how much of the population has to be vaccinated. So if about 4% does not respond, you can imagine for that upper critical threshold that is 95%, we actually have to add 4% of that. So that means that 99% of the population needs to be vaccinated against measles so that we actually reach 95% critical threshold threshold level for herd immunity to even work. So that's something to keep in mind. So now that we've got some examples, we're actually going to tie back to, well, why the heck does measles have a higher critical threshold than smallpox? And the answer to that actually has to do with the question on the top of this page, and that is R0. So we know that R0 has something to do with herd immunity. It's how we figure out threshold, but what exactly does it have to do with that? So let's start here on a blank page and let's begin first by defining what R0 is. So R0 is referred to as the basic reproductive number and this is for a virus population. And so what that really amounts to is the number of secondary infections that can arise in a large population of susceptible hosts from a single infected individual. So really what that comes down to is if in a population of susceptible hosts we have an individual that is sick, how many people are they going to get sick? And there's a lot of different examples that are shown here in this figure. So I'm going to write some of the examples up top here so I can save the rest of the room here for some math that we're going to do. So for measles, the R0 value is somewhere between 12 and 18. So measles is shown down here. The one six one sick person is yellow and then the red orange here is representing the number of people that will get sick. So for measles, that's between 12 and 18. For smallpox, it's between 5 and 7. For flu, it's between 1 to 2. For the 1918 pandemic, it was between 2.4 and 5.4. And then for, we'll do one more. So for Ebola, it's about 1.3 to 1.8. So a lot of those are shown here. So here is Ebola and here in the middle is SARS. So this was the SARS epidemic from 2002, 2003. And then here is, um, it's incorrectly labeled. It is labeled with the disease name and not the virus name. So we, of course, are smarter than some of these pictures. So let's go ahead and relabel this properly as SARS-CoV-2. So this is SARS-Coronavirus-2. And for the current pandemic, based on the data that we have thus far, it's estimated that the R0 is somewhere between 2 to 3. So we can use this R0 and we can use it to help us 
calculate the herd immunity threshold. So I promise the math will not be too bad. It's a pretty simple equation. The equation is one minus one over R naught. So if we take the two to three R naught and plug it into this equation, what we will actually get is that 50 to 70% of the population must be immune. And again, this is for the current coronavirus outbreak. And one of the things that you'll notice is that as your R naught number increases, the threshold number increases. And so more immune people are needed for herd immunity to work and for herd immunity to stop the spread due to that indirect protection. And so this is why for measles, if I back up here for a second, for measles we said that our critical threshold is much higher than smallpox. And now that we've introduced the R naughts, it kind of makes sense because if we take a look at the R naughts for measles and smallpox, for measles, it is much higher. So I encourage you to work through the math and make sure that I did my math correctly as well. But now, hopefully this gives you a little bit of insight when it comes to the R naughts that are being thrown around and the herd immunity that is being thrown around in the news. So kind of moving forward, we've already said this, but some of the problems of HERS that we have with vaccination come down to some of the ideas that go through society, right? So viral diseases are a thing of the past. Um, I'm hoping that with the current pandemic, that view will at least change. Um, if the pandemic has taught us anything, it is certainly that viral diseases are not a thing of the past. Um, herd immunity has not proven to work. Again, that's not something that is true. Polio is long gone. Also not true. We still get small outbreaks of polio. And actually, one of the things that will likely happen because of the pandemic, we have actually decreased vaccination because we don't want to send people around to vaccinate to potentially spread and move the disease around that is currently outbreaking. And so the thought is because we're vaccinating less against polio, and measles right now that we'll actually see an increase in those. You know, people like to say, I never get the flu. Or one of my favorite ones is, I know a guy who got the flu shot and then got the flu, right? We hear that a lot as well. I'm not injecting anything into my body. People should just get infected naturally, right? Chicken pox is just a trivial kid's disease. So all of these things are probably things that we've all heard, things that people like to say. And when it comes to vaccination of HERS, we all need to work together. We all need to work on educating everyone on why they work and how they work. And so that of HERS takes confidence. It takes trust. It takes trust between the physician, the patient, and of HERS, the scientist. So this is something that, you know, even Edward Jenner ran into in the 1700s, and it's something that will never go away. And of HERS, because of a lot of these ideas, um, we have seen measles cases rise a lot. And so in 2000, um, measles was considered eliminated. And then last year in 2019, we started to see, or in 2019, I should say, we saw the largest outbreak of cases. We've been seeing outbreaks since 2000 due to the decrease in measles vaccination, but at least in 2019, it was the largest that we had seen. Up until now, I think, again, because of the coronavirus outbreak and because we're decreasing vaccination, it's thought that millions of kids will actually not get their vaccinations for measles this year because of the pandemic. I think that in 2020, 2021, we'll actually see larger numbers. But again, this is something that is ongoing and that we will continue to see. And here is a really interesting image that I like to show. Um, this is not data from America. This is actually data from Great Britain. But even though it is from Great Britain, 
it does not mean that this is not what we see. And so um, we see something very similar in our country. So on the x-axis, we have the dates. On the y-axis, we have the percent of the MMR uptake. So how many people got vaccinated. And then here on the y-axis for the yellow, this is the confirmed cases of measles. So as you can tell in this graph, as the percentage of vaccinated individuals decrease um, below 90%, we see a corresponding increase in cases. So we see this little drop here and we see, of course, an increase as well. So we need a pretty high percentage of the population to be immune with measles. When we drop below that, we see that corresponding increase in cases. So now that we've talked about the importance of vaccinations and how they work, now we got to talk about vaccinations themselves. So we are ready to move on into part two, and we're going to get our feet wet with this part. And then when we come back for day two, we will actually talk about all the different ways that vaccines are made, and we'll give you examples of ones that are made in those ways. So vaccines are split into two types. They're split into active and passive. So for active vaccines, these are going to give you long-term protection. So if you recall, the goal of HERS is memory. So you want to be exposed to it once, have memory, and be protected for your entire life. And so typically for active vaccines, we will give modified pathogens or we will give material that is derived from the pathogen. And again, we will get into more details of what that means for passive. Passive vaccination is going to be short-term protection. And typically for passive, we're going to give products of the immune system. And so what that means is we're going to give antibodies or immune cells. And so this usually deals with convalescent serum. So you've probably heard on the news about donations being asked for patients who have had COVID-19 and have recovered from the disease and they now have protective immunity against SARS-CoV-2, and so people are asking for donations for that. So we'll talk more about that at the end of day two. So there are two examples of passive that we're going to talk about, and then the remainder of this topic we will spend talking about active. So for passive examples, the first one that we're going to talk about is actually shown here in the picture, and that is the rabies immunoglobulin vaccine. And of course, immunoglobulin is an antibody. And so for this vaccine, this vaccine is antibodies from donors who got the vaccine. And so typically what happens is this is going to be injected into where you got bit. So we've mentioned this a couple of times in this class, but the idea that rabies of course takes a long time to get to the CNS. And so when you're bit, you certainly have time before um, you have to completely and utterly panic, right? But the first thing that happens when you're bit by an animal who we suspect has rabies is you will get two vaccines. The first vaccine that you will get is this immunoglobulin, and this is usually injected where you got bit to help with neutralizing those viruses at the um, bite site. And then, of course, you will also get the um, other vaccine that will help you with your active immunity and give you long-term memory. So we'll talk more about that vaccine in day two. So for passive, that's gonna be antibodies from other people that were made by other individuals. And probably the best example of passive example of vaccination is of hers, mother to baby. 
particularly during breastfeeding. So we're going to draw a graph to represent this. So on the x-axis heel here, we will have time. So here will be birth. We'll do one year here and then eventually the child will be an adult. And then on the y-axis, we'll draw the fraction of adult immunity and we'll make this a hundred percent. So what we will draw, let's see, let's do purple for mom's immune system. So what we will see is during pregnancy and then following birth, we'll see that the child will have the mother's immune system and then as breastfeeding weans of hers, we will see a decrease in that protectiveness from the mother. But once the child is born, so we'll say child slash progeny immune system. So we will see an increase then until eventually they are making their own antibodies. And by the time they are, on a, they are an adult, they will have their own adult immunity. And so this is, again, probably one of the best examples when it comes to passive, in, passive examples of vaccines. So what we're going to do now is we are going to round off day one with talking about what should effective vaccines be and what should they have. So I'm going to give you a bunch of examples. And as always, if there's something that I have not listed, please make sure to comment it in the comments below. So one of the most important things of HERS that we need vaccines to do is we need a proper induction of an immune response. So what this means is we must make antibodies. And of course, the other thing is we of course need to be protected against the disease caused by the virulent form of a specific pathogen. Another big thing is safety, right? So we don't want disease from the vaccine. We want minimal side effects. And ideally, of course, we would want long lasting protection. Kind of other things outside of um, safety and things like that is also storage. So there's definitely storage considerations. So a lot of vaccines um, have to be kept frozen, which can be a problem in countries where there's not freezers and refrigeration. And so we have to have special containers that will keep them frozen for a couple days. Other things of hers are genetic stability. So depending on the virus, it might not be the entire virion, it might be a portion of the genome, or there might be genetic engineering that was done, so the genome has to be stable. Um, cost is a big issue, so usually we aim for vaccines, or we would, in the perfect world, of course, want vaccines to cost less than $1, so that's kind of what the WHO pushes for, is they push for cheaper vaccines in terms of cost. And of course, a big thing is delivery method, right? So wouldn't it be nice if we didn't have to get poked every time we got a vaccine? I personally absolutely hate needles. So um, unfortunately, most of our vaccines are of course a shot, which brings in other things. And of course, that increases the cost, right? Because now you have to deal with a needle. Well, making a needle costs money. Now you have to deal with proper disposal of the needle. And then, you know, you've got all sorts of other issues that you have to deal with because of that. Um, we also have oral vaccines. We have nasal vaccines. Wouldn't it be nice if we could each just eat like, you know, a Freddie Flintstone vitamin and that was our vaccine and it tasted good too? Like that would be wonderful. But, you know, maybe in the next couple of years we'll get there. So these are all things that effective vaccines should have or all things that effective vaccines should be. So again, there are definitely things that I missed on here. So if there are things that you came up with, please put them in the comments below. So we are actually going to stop here for day one. And when we come back 
for day two, we're actually going to get into the question of, okay, now that we know what a vaccine is, we know some of our goals of making vaccines, we know how they work, how are they made, and what are some of the examples? So thanks for hanging out with me, and I will see everyone in day two. Bye, y'all.